happens far too frequently. But in antiquity, um, there's a similarity. Right? There's a similarity. It's not the Hippocratic Oath. It's, it's sort of these tenets. These tenets then condition the way in which an, an individual acts. Right? Similarly, if in, in a contemporary setting, you're charged with doing no harm, and you're the type of practitioner that likes to operate on your patients without giving them um, anesthesia, well, you're not acting in accordance with your charge. Right? Your charge is to make sure that you minimize um, the harm that you do as much as possible in order to help cure the patient and such, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, number eight, attaining harmony and balance then became paramount for the physician, who was also charged with aiding the patient in reconciling these opposites, right? The physician, him or herself, had to be a very harmoniously balanced individual. I'll talk about, in the next section, I think, in two sections, the actual term, right? The physician, Eryximachus, when he enters the party, it's like, oh wow, that, that's the physician. You can tell. Look how he carries himself. That's Eryximachus. You can tell that he's a physician because he's balanced. He's temperate. I'll have a glass of wine, but I won't have too much. I'll eat a little bit, but I won't eat too much. I'll sleep a little bit, but I won't sleep too much. Like the physician is going to have to himself embody, literally, physically embody, physically represent these standards of, of balance because the idea is, during antiquity, why in the world would I want to go to a physician that seemed like he was out of balance? <laughs> I don't want to go to a physician who's out of balance. You, it, it, in a contemporary setting, this isn't true at all, right? We don't think about, well, you know, my doctor seems to be a little overweight. Um, should I go to my doctor and ask my doctor about um, dieting if my doctor is him or herself overweight? I mean, there is some justification for this. I'm, I'm trying to show you where the justification lies. We, we, we recognize now that it's, it's completely fallacious though, right? Very, very smart doctors um, might for themselves not attain the perfect normativized standard, but they definitely know what they're talking about and they can help you attain it, though they might not want to or cannot attain it themselves, right? So that the idea is, in antiquity though, that was a no-no. That was a no-go. No one's gonna go to the doctor who, who looks physically out of balance, right? If, if he always seems that he's sleepy, if he always seems groggy, if he's excessively overweight or excessively underweight, I don't want to go to the physician who doesn't embody in his body, in his biological being, these tenets of medicine. If you don't embody these tenets of medicine, then I don't, you know, I'm not going to do services with you. So that the physical presence of the individual um, is a very, 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 very powerful means with which we represent the tenets of um, the medical community at that time. Okay, that should be clear. Number nine then, so I, I don't really, I'm skipping um, writing on the board. Number nine, love, enjoying the sound, believe it or not, and I just had this really amazing conversation with another another person on some virtual stuff and he was like, yeah, you know, if you know, there, there are problems with, there's problems with, you know, physicists' account of the weight of the universe, blah, 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 and they should, you know, dark matter should be this, and da, 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 and some person said that, you know, it was love that was holding all of this together. Nobody wants to believe that your batteries are powered by love or fixed by love, but back then, back then, love actually played a pretty huge explanatory role. Obviously because there wasn't the technological means of assessing the truth, per se. But the truth at that time, what was an inference to the best explanation at that time, love, number nine, was at the time assumed to be one of the factors necessary to aid in the process of reconciling imbalances within the body. Right? Love was a means of reconciling these imbalances. Right? This is just one of many. Um, quote, the science of what the body loves or desires as regards repletion and evacuation. Right? It's not about indulgence. It's not about um, an overindulgence right? or fetishized desire. No, it's about the body loves water. Right? The body loves air. The body loves sunlight. The body loves physical exertion. The body loves, you know, fill in the blank, mental stimulation. Right? 
the idea then was if the body if the body loves this thing this phenomenon and you deny the body that love then you're introducing aspects of imbalance in the body because the body is naturally this is the argument then the body is naturally inclined to seek those things out and if you happen to be an individual where that inclination isn't at the forefront then there must be a problem with you as the individual and not just not just a physical problem not just a biological problem but there's cosmologically something wrong right there's there, there, we, there becomes problems with this later but you got to be charitable to the argument at the time right um, the main thrust of this isn't to knock their beliefs the main thrust of um, this is to recognize the absolute essential role that the physical body and the physical representation of skill belief uh, knowledge manifested in the body in the height in the weight in the structure in the muscle in the tone in the skin in the complexion in the you know in the way the individual is groomed it is a representation of virtue so uh, lastly number two um, though the physician could identify the imbalances within the body and prescribe a change in one's behavior and I, obviously I'm playing on the word prescribe here the prescription mandated that the patient exert self-control, sophrosune. Right? The idea of sophrosune is within antiquity is self-control is, is, is balance. Right? I'm going to help you balance your life by telling you how to control yourself. Because obviously you are ill and you are sick because there is an inability in you to, on your own accord, say no. Or to say yes, right? There is an inability within the patient to attain some balance. And what the medical practitioner does, and this is still true today, is that the medical practitioner prescribes in order for the patient to attain balance, right? And then once the patient has attained balance and feels better or is cured, obviously there's no role left for the medical practitioner to play because now I, I'm, I'm no longer needed. My servers, my services. Are no longer needed. You can imagine then, and this holds then and it holds now, which is why specifically I'm constructing this series like this, right? This, what I'm about to say, holds then and it holds now. The greater the levels of imbalance, and we'll put square quotes around imbalance for the contemporary setting, but the greater the levels of imbalance within the patient is the greater the need for the medical community to prescribe a mechanism of balance. In a contemporary setting, you know, we're not going to say you should just feel some love, right? No, we'll give you a pill to help you balance your cholesterol or to, or to balance your mental state or to balance whatever it is that might not, might be out of balance. But the idea is exactly the same. Now, the idea is exactly the same. If you're just a little out of balance, well, you only need a little bit of the prescription. If you're really out of balance, well, you might need a lot more of the prescription. Similarly, in antiquity, if you were really out of balance, well, the, your relationship with the physician is going to be one where you are continually going to seek advice, discussion, discourse, dialogue from the physician in order for you to have a better understanding about how you attain self-control how you attain balance, right? So it, it maps one to one. I mean, it's a huge distinction. We're talking about a profoundly different means of assessing observable phenomena with respect to health and sickness, but the underlying, the underlying structure is exactly the same. Okay, uh, last point, number 11. Number 11. Since the ancients conceptualized, this is a very key point, right? Since the ancients conceptualized ethics in terms of virtue, and the ill body is a consequence of excessive imbalances within the body, it follows that a physically attractive body exhibits both health, obviously, duh, and, which we wouldn't think now, and, more importantly, virtue. The fact that you look good means that just the fact that you're healthy, but the fact that you are a virtuous person. 
we've completely undermined this now, right? There's that genius scene in um, in um, Paul Ellis's American Psycho where um, Pat Bateman looks in the mirror and he's completely disheveled. He looks like, no, you know, he looks completely gorgeous. It's the other way around. He looks completely gorgeous. He's totally well kept. He's completely, you know, clean shaven. He looks amazing. And on the inside, it's all this rot, right? So that's Paul Ellis's critique on an antiquity, in a sense. It's genius piece out of American Psycho. But the idea is to be charitable to the ancients is that no, if you looked the part, you were the part. Not only were you healthy, but you were virtuous because to look that good means you had to act in a certain way. Conversely then, if you didn't look good, if you weren't attractive, if you were ugly, if you weren't fit, then the idea is not only were you unhealthy, but you were immoral. <laughs> you were a bad person. That you were a bad person. It's not just the fact that you are not conforming to the standard, but you are not a good person as such. And that's the image that I have uh, that I have on the bottom. So that concludes this section of the analysis. There's no need to go into the description of the, the image. It's very, very self-explanatory. I didn't want to overkill it for the first hour of the lecture series. So um, hopefully that made sense of an introductory account into virtue ethics and um, virtue ethics within the broader discourse of medical ethics. So I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.